Hello and welcome to the first ever BFRB Club webinar. Uh, we will open this series of webinars uh, with one about self-talk and BFRBs. Uh, for those of you uh, who are VIP lounge members, you can suggest topics for next month and the month after. So I will be following your lead uh, with the topics. Uh, we're starting with the, with self-talk and BFRBs because I find that this topic is um, general enough to be of relevance for most people who struggle with BFRBs, if not all. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think it can uh, help us understand some very specific problems that people encounter on their kind of either in therapy or whatever kind of healing journey they're on, um, namely different ways in which uh, negative self-talk will amplify, um, make your BFRB worse, and ways in which it can get you to stop trying to treat it and how that reflects on your self-worth and self-esteem in the end. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let me get started with the, with the webinar. Uh, as always, when I do webinars, I will give you a brief overview of the structure of the webinar. Uh, first, we will start about um, we will start talking about what narratives are in psychology, um, because a self-talk is a way, in a way, reading a script. It follows a certain narrative that we have about ourselves. Uh, so we'll talk about what they are, what's the purpose of having them to begin with. Then we will talk about four different types of negative self-talk. Uh, we will then obviously link that negative self-talk with BFRBs. We'll talk about causes and maintenance factors uh, in the sense in which uh, negative self-talk can cause you to pick your skin or pull your hair uh, and maintenance factors uh, in the sense in which... Uh, negative self-talk can prevent you from seeking treatment or uh, maintain your BFRB through one of those uh, very annoying vicious cycles that are that we tend to initiate and then cannot get out of. And then in the end, I will say a few words about reframing narratives. This is a rather complex topic, and I might address this in uh, in separate blog posts as well and expand a little bit more about what I'm, what I plan to say here, and if this is of any interest to you, by all means, I can create a whole webinar about how to change this course, at least internal discourse around BFRBs. Uh, in my opinion, it's a topic that's quite important but far too complex to go into details uh, in a webinar that deals with negative self-talk. So. Uh, in the broadest sense, uh, narratives in psychology are just stories that we tell ourselves. And those are some stories that help us organize how we see ourselves, to organize our social roles, so how we relate to other people, as well as some private experiences that we have. Making sense of our own memories about things that have happened to us, about our desires, and so on. Uh, different schools of psychology will use uh, different specific definitions, but broadly speaking, a narrative is a story. So we all tell stories about ourselves to ourselves, and we tell stories about other people too. Uh, these two things, stories about ourselves and stories about other people, are intrinsically related. So uh, from the point of view of constructivist psychology, which is my pretty much default point of view at all times. There is really no separating uh, how we, who we are from how we are seen and how we want to be seen and the kind of feedback that we get from other people. Essentially, from, from uh, the point of view of a constructivist psychology, our narratives, the stories that we tell about the world and ourselves, come from the very interaction with the world. So when you talk to people, um, when you hear how they perceive you, um, or you when, you when you notice something, even if they don't say it, that will change uh, your narrative 
But at the same time, that narrative is what will guide your actions. So there's a recursive cycle going on where uh, based on the stories that we tell, we act in the world in different ways. And then depending on how these actions um, affect us or whatever desired outcome for us is, we might have to adjust those narratives. So they are dynamic structures. Uh, most of us don't have one in the same story that we tell ourselves our entire lives. However, even when stories evolve, become more complex or simpler, depending on the twists and turns and, and where our lives go, uh, there are certain, let's say, aspects of those narratives that can sometimes remain maybe not, not identical, but then certainly stable enough. Uh, this is what gives us the impression that we are always the same person. Uh, the kind, what gives us the impression that there is a, some kind of a stability to our personality, whereas we are always in motion because we're always interacting with the world. So we're always making small adjustments. But small adjustments don't have to affect every single aspect of the story that we tell, just some aspects. Uh, we will see with negative self-talk specifically, uh, unfortunately, and I will say rather obviously, because these things that are very hard to change are usually those things that have been present for a very long time. And negative self-talk is one of those. So it's, it's an element, a part of the complete narrative that we have about ourselves. And it's usually a very old part. And this is why sometimes when, when self-talk is very negative, very intense, let's say you've just had a picking or a pulling episode, and then after the initial relief, the guilt sets in. And when you feel guilty, all those, uh, all those negative aspects of your self-narrative come to the surface. And it seems like that is most of you or all of you, like there's nothing else. So unfortunately, negative self-talk has this ability to impose its presence in our psychological space in a way that pushes away everything else that could be valuable um, or useful in that given moment. So if you need one simple definition, that narrative is just a story that we tell about ourselves and about the world. Uh, the question is, do we have just one narrative? Or do we, do we have many of them? Uh, if you're watching this instead of listening to this, this is, a, this is a, a, a part of a painting by Diego Rivera called Weaving. Um, to me, weaving narratives, weaving stories, that, that was the association. So there will be a lot of weavers in this, in this presentation. Uh, uh, the point, however, of this slide is to uh, say something else, which is that, um, as much as we have this idea that we are one, I don't feel like I'm five people. And hopefully most of you who listen to this don't feel like you're five people. Even though in different situations, uh, when we play different social roles, we can adopt behaviors that are staggeringly different. Uh, for example, I know my colleagues, so other therapists or psychiatrists, who in their professional lives have excellent boundaries. And then you see them with their loved ones and boundaries are nowhere to be found. So they have one uh, way of, of, uh, of telling the story about relationships when they're at work. And then they have a completely different story about how relationships unfold when they're at home. Uh, that tells us that they have more than one, one, more than one story that they tell about themselves. Uh, and in fact, in order to navigate our lives, we most frequently have several competing narratives. And so more than one self-image, technically speaking. Uh, so we're not as integrated as we may like to think. Uh, back in the beginning of the 20th century, when Freud invented psychoanalysis, uh, one of the things that he talked about is that a personality has to be integrated. Uh, this is because the world back then was much, much simpler. Uh, there was a, um, a Polish-British sociologist called Sigmund Bauman, who was not a psychoanalyst himself, but he used some of Freud's ideas in his work. 
And he talked about how after World War II, essentially, that most of the West went in one direction, and that direction, sociologically speaking, favored individualism over collectivism, for example. And so he said uh, the world became increasingly complex, but we were left to our own devices to figure out the solutions. So some of us have to play uh, not just one role in life, but two, three, or four. And you know, just on a very banal everyday level, uh, people will do all kinds of things to feed their families, including things that they would never like their children to do. So what they have to do is they have to tell two separate stories to themselves. One story of them as, them as parents, and then another story of them doing whatever it is that they want to do. Uh, to give you a slightly less, maybe a radical example or dramatic example, um, as a therapist, I have one set of behaviors. Uh, my clients tell me things I disagree with on, 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 on the daily, basically. I, In fact, I would have to say that in one day, I think I hear far more stories that I disagree with, choices that I don't think are necessarily the best, values that are quite different than mine. But in my professional role, I have a certain set of um, I, concepts or ways of thinking and ways of behaving that make it very easy for me to work with this. I'm not disturbed by, by differences that I have with my clients. In fact, I rather enjoy those. I think the more distant uh, uh, a system of, of values, the more distant the narratives that my clients tell from mine, the better, because I feel intellectually challenged. But And I will never argue with my clients, obviously. But then on the other hand, in my private life, I also have friends that don't agree with me around certain things. But my spontaneous answer will not be to say, mm-hmm, and what does this mean to you? Or how do you feel when you're saying this? Or, you know, like any of the therapeutic questions, I might actually engage in, in a discussion or even in a debate that I will want to win. And I don't have a feeling that I'm a different person at work and at home, even though there I have very different rules uh, in terms of how to behave and how to think about other people. And the reason why I don't have this split personality uh, is because there is an overarching element to both of these, which is that I generally value diversity of opinion. I like my ideas to be challenged. I like it when people say things that intrigue me. But that's, in my opinion, that's just how we grow. And at the end of the day, you know, everyone has to live with their ideas. So why should I be disturbed when people live with different ideas than I do? Uh, so in that sense, we tell many stories about ourselves. Uh, except that these stories are usually linked by certain uh, values or principles. I'm trying to explain this without going into technical details. But so uh, in, in constructivist psychology, we would say that our systems have a healthy degree of fragmentation. So constructs are separated, but on a very high superordinate level, they are united, unified. So there is a common thread to all of it. So having several different narratives about ourselves actually allows us to reconcile different social roles and therefore different rules and different images of ourselves. And then sometimes very contradictory demands that these different roles impose on us. So, there, so a typical person has this healthy kind of um, uh, separation. We can say in... Uh, in some post-constructivist psycho psychologies, a lot of the, a lot of, for example, inner family systems uh, or even narrative therapy, uh, dialogue, uh, what's his name? Um, there was a Dutch psychologist called uh, Hubert Hermans, uh, the dialogical self theory. Uh, they're all essentially just elaborations of this constructivist idea. Um, and the idea is that these fragments of, of, of ourselves, so these different parts of us, these different narratives, the, they interact with the outside world, obviously, but they also interact inside, in between. And some psychologists even go as far as calling these subpersonalities. 
uh, I have nothing against either of these terms as long as we know what we're talking about. So we have different narratives, therefore we have different sub-personalities, parts of us. My favorite constructivist psychologist, Miller Mayer, calls that the community of selves. He says, we're not one self, we are a community of different selves. So different selves have different relationships with each other. And in therapy, outside of uh, body-focused repetitive behaviors, we will sometimes elaborate these relationships and work on changing them. Here today, today in this webinar, I will talk about only one, I will not talk about this comprehensive community, rather about one or two of those problematic selves, those selves that cause unnecessary suffering to us and that can contribute negatively to your BFRB. So we will be focusing on the on the less pleasant aspects of this rather interesting approach. So how do we make these narratives? That's also something I would like to address. If they're stories, that means that we tell the stories. So we have a degree of control in terms of how these stories are told. Uh, in constructivist theory, we can make the case very easily that we always choose, that everything we do consciously or not is always a choice, except that we of course cannot forget that we don't live in a theoretical vacuum. We live in, in a society and in a culture. So certain choices are not ours to make, or if they are, sometimes their options are presented to us. So you can say that a narrative that you have about yourself is an interplay between stories that other people tell about you, stories that you tell about yourself within the confines of what's considered to be acceptable social reality. So there are at least three different levels uh, of, of storytelling here. There's the whole culture that will give us some elements of every story. Those are some concepts like um, race or gender, all these kind of structural things that seem integral to our reality. Um, uh, for example, the notion of marriage is also something that our, that our culture will, will give us. It, will, it has to be an element in our narratives, even if we don't choose marriage necessarily, but then you are a person who has chosen not to get married. And because social reality has this category, you can't really escape it. You can just choose how to relate to it. Then we have the second layer, a little less impersonal, which is the layer of the people that we interact with. So people that we talk to, people that are our friends, uh, and the stories that they tell about us. And then there are those stories that we personally tell ourselves about ourselves. All these three layers will overlap sometimes merge, sometimes diverge, but eventually they will make a coherent narrative. Um, so uh, let's consider how these narratives relate specifically to BFRBs, because as much as I enjoy talking about um, psychological theories in general, I feel like um, I should probably keep my focus around BFRBs. Later on, if you would like me to expand on any of this, I would be happy to prepare a blog post or you can submit the uh, submit questions in the ask away uh, section and I will in, in the Q&A that I will put out uh, for this webinar in about two weeks, I will I, I will address anything else that you would like to know. Because every element of our lives is covered by a story, BFRBs also have stories that are told around them. What your personal narrative around your BFRB is, is really up to you to discover. There are no recipes. Uh, it, and it really depends on the other stories that you have. Some common themes, so not maybe th the main elements of every narrative around a BFRB are things that are concern, that concern your, what your skin looks like or what your hair looks like. For example, having perfect skin might be at the center of your narrative if you struggle with uh, skin picking. And then what's important for you to look at there is uh, what will be the story about what the perfect skin is? How do you recognize the perfect skin? What's the opposite of the perfect skin? Um, how did you come to the idea that this is important? Was it yours? Was it 
something from your family and so on. So that would be an element of, of, of a story, not everyone's obviously. For example, uh, BFRBs, uh, especially excoriation disorders, so dermatillomania, are connected to our bodies very intimately and sometimes associated with body dysmorphia. Uh, in, that, in that case, we can say with uh, different uh, and maybe unusual stories that we tell ourselves about our bodies. So, so your relationship to your body, the way that you enjoy your body or not enjoy your body as the body as the case may be. So love or hatred for the body could be the central elements of the story. Um, it can also be about strength and weakness. This is something that I very frequently hear when people talk about trying to stop uh, pulling or picking. They, they will say, I'm weak uh, or I should be strong enough to stop. I should have enough willpower to quit this. So strength, weakness would be a dichotomy that seems to play an important role. Then there's the issue of control. Like I should have control over this part of my life. And then when where the story really comes into play is what does it tell us about us if we don't have control over something? You know, what kind of a person does that make you? Uh, I hope you didn't hear that because I don't know how to edit sound, but apparently someone is screaming in front of my house. Um, uh, so a BFRB can play a key role as evidence for a negative narrative that you have about yourself. Uh, if you grew up, for example, in a family that values um, willpower and self-control, right? Uh, you see yourself picking or pulling and then you think, ha, huh, so I'm weak and out of control. Everyone else in my family is in control, but I'm weak and I am out of control. So in that sense, the, your BFRB plays a role in separating you from your family. This can be very painful, but also very liberating. So you can see here how very quickly when we start talking about narratives, we move away from the these from from the banality, if you will, of the symptom itself, and move into a rather um, or maybe slightly deeper psychological waters. So it's it's easier to it's easy to to swim to go very deep when you think about narratives rather than just behaviors or just thoughts. Always think of them in terms of you know what part of the story is this. Uh, so. Where does the self-talk uh, play into this? Um, our self-talk is always a function of the narratives that operate in our minds. Uh, to put this in simpler terms, uh, your negative self-talk is determined by the story you tell yourself about yourself. When my negative self-talk comes about, I'm going to hate myself probably for different reasons uh, than, than most of you, because we're all very different. So our stories have very specific elements that our negative self-talk comes from. So the kind, the way that you speak to yourself depends on the kinds of stories you have at your disposal. I mentioned this dichotomy between strong and weak as something that figures into many, many stories that I hear uh, about uh, BFRBs. Um, let's say if that is an aspect of your of, of one or more of your internal narratives, um, then one thing that you can uh, possibly contemplate uh, is, um, is how this dimension shapes you, the way your negative self-talk is, is played in your head. Uh, if you have to be strong and you see yourself as weak, or rather maybe your, your, the voice in your head, metaphorically speaking, tells you that you're weak, uh, then that voice will probably speak from a position of strength. So it's not going to be a gentle, tender, kind, loving voice. It's going to be a very harsh voice. On the other hand, uh, if control is something that's important to you and uh, the voice in your head tells you that you don't have control, perhaps the tone of that voice will reflect having control. And that means that the voice doesn't have to be very harsh it can also just be composed and calm. You know, your, your inner hater, for, for the lack of a better word, can be 
like Meryl Streep in Dev Devil Wears Prada, or it can be like Anthony Hopkins in in The Silence of the Lambs, um, or it can be like um, um, I'm trying to find a raging supervillain, but where are they when you need them? Uh, Charlize Theron comes to my mind in that movie Monster. Um, Eileen Warnes, as I believe the character. So she was a little more expressive, let's let's say. So, so in that sense, uh, depending on the elements of the story, your self-talk and negative self-talk as well will have will have different ways of manifesting. You will see that when we start talking about uh, understanding your self-talk and changing it, this will actually play a role. Uh, the the last sentence here is crucial. Self-talk only has power if you actually believe it's true. So this is the only way your self-talk is going to affect you in any way. And I'm saying this because uh, most people by default think of these negative voices in their heads as being uh, true. If you think about it, our brains produce a lot of thoughts and we don't really think of many of those as being true. We have thoughts about hitting people, about you know cussing them out, kicking them out of our houses, all kinds of things. And we rarely ever listen to them because we, we are capable of understanding that a lot of what goes on in our heads is just metaphorical. Like how many times has someone told you I'm going to kill you and you don't really think that you're going to kill them? At least I don't. I just see that as an indication of my emotional state, which is usually frustrated or angry. So it, we don't believe the literal value of our thoughts until they touch those core topics of the narratives that we have about ourselves. Uh, for example, if you tell me that, I don't know, that I suck at cooking, I will probably say, okay, and just continue with my day. You have, if I have a thought, and I frequently have that thought, this meal that you just prepared tastes like shit. Um, yeah, I'll have that thought and I won't care uh, because it doesn't really connect to any fear that I have. I don't think of myself as a person who knows how to cook anyway. So I don't really care if, if I think my own cooking is bad or if someone else does. But on the other hand, um, I don't know, I'm looking at this uh, painting here. Um, if someone tells me you don't know anything about art history, that might sting a little bit. Because I like to think that I know a little bit. I don't consider myself an expert by any stretch of imagination. But I do know quite a bit since I grew up in a family where art is quite a big deal. So we, you know, one of those pretentious families where you argue about different painters over dinner. So I, I like to think that I have this decent education when it comes to art. So if you, if I'm, let's say, unsure in that, I think this component was missing in my example. So if, if I have this belief, but there's also part of me that doubts it, negative self-talk then becomes real. Because when you're absolutely certain about something, then it doesn't really affect you. So if you tell me, I don't know constructivist psychology, I will just treat you like as a fly that's flying around my head. I really don't care. Because there are very few things in my life that I'm that sure of. And knowing Kelly's constructivism is one of those things. So, neg so getting criticism or having a negative thought about that... Uh, I, I will just let it go. I won't pay any attention. It will have absolutely zero emotional impact on me. Just a few days ago, I was teaching because it's the, now the semester started. So I was teaching, of course, constructivist psychology. And uh, I finished the, the, the lecture. And then I thought, because I was half prepared for it. And then I thought, oh, you could have done this better. And it's true, I could have. I've, I gave them all the relevant information. My students seem to have enjoyed the lecture but i know that i can do much better but my negative self-talk that was present afterwards you know i kind of listed all the things that i did mention or better examples that i could have given it didn't really shake my confidence because fundamentally i know that i know this theory and i know that i teach well uh, so in that sense it doesn't really affect me very much but when it comes to art like i i know that i i i have a lot of stuff about art in my head but i've never studied art history 
So there I'm shakier. So negative self-talk is more likely to affect me there because I'm shakier. Uh, it's very easy to learn about those those elements of your self, uh, self narratives, your stories, uh, is what topics trigger you essentially. And those are your, let's say, weak spots. Although I don't like to use the word weak spots, but let's say places where maybe you could use some more, uh, some more storytelling. Uh, this is not this classification on four types of negative self-talk is not something that I invented. I come across this every now and then in different CBT books about anxiety. Uh, so I think it's I don't think it works for everyone. I think some people might benefit from combining these. Uh, some people might have to invent their own uh, uh, you know antagonist and characterize them in the way that works for them. But I find that most people can recognize themselves in at least one of these, which is why this classification is very useful. So therefore, we can talk about four types of self-talk. Uh, the worrier, uh, and here you have two names. If you look at the slide, uh, the worrier, which would be quote unquote, the official name, and then Lord of Anxiety, which is how a colleague of mine calls these. So I asked her if I can use her dramatic names and she said, sure. So the warrior or lord of anxiety, the critic or lord of self-loathing, uh, the victim, lord of depression, and the perfectionist, lord of not good enough. So essentially, there are four types of self-talk, a warrior, critic, victim, and perfectionist. I will explain how each of these operate very quickly so that you can see which one rings true for you. Uh, the warrior or lord of anxiety, uh likes uh so uh, the warrior likes those stories uh that have very bad outcomes they don't necessarily sh put you in a bad light it's just that the outcome is the worst possible outcome for you so in terms of your self-worth or or self-esteem uh, the warrior is more or less neutral because it doesn't it doesn't attack that it just reminds you of all the things that could go wrong so the warrior fantasizes about catastrophes, about panic, about embarrassment, illness, death, and so on, like all these uh, tragic things. For example, you go to the airport and the warrior says, what if there's a traffic jam and you're late for your flight and then you don't get a refund and you lose your money? Uh, if you get on the plane, the warrior might say, well, uh, you know, sure, plane crashes are rare, but it's not impossible. What if your plane crashes? You know, what if a UFO shows up and just kidnaps all of you and you'll, you'll lose five years of your life. You know, like that's the kind of thing that the warrior would do. So the warrior always wonders about the what ifs in your life. That's, that's his or her, I don't know what, what gender your, your warrior is. It's, it's your warrior's main concern. It's a voice that you may hear when you're about to start dealing with your BFRB but when you want to try something new or start again, if you had a relapse, that's the kind, that's that voice that says, what if this doesn't help? What if nothing helps? What if I fail again? What if I relapse again? The warrior doesn't have answers to these questions. Uh, the warrior just has questions. And that is precisely why the warrior is called Lord of Anxiety. It's because by not having answers, it provokes anxiety because if the warrior says you will relapse again you can then say fine i'll prepare or i'll try out a better technique but no the warrior says what if nothing helps dot 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 and then it's very easy it's very tempting even to feel anxious about that but that's the only thing that the warrior does uh, one thing about these uh, i like to call them characters because we're talking about storytelling and narratives so that is that could be rather a part of your personality, one of the sub personalities. The warrior is is the one who just asks questions but never has any answers to them. It's like it's, I don't know if you ever had these professors. I used to have one professor in medical school who annoyed me so much because he was he would answer every question with a question. Like you ask, what happens if you I don't know like subdose someone um and then he says that's a very good question what does happen and 
at some point you start thinking, well, I'm here to learn from you. So why don't you just tell me what happens and save us all the trouble, right? So when I when I encounter warriors, uh, they tend to make me uh, not angry, but irritated. Whereas most people who live with warriors just become anxious. And the difference is, uh, between how I react to a warrior and how someone who has a warrior as, as a part of their personality is that I know what my rights are uh, in a certain relationship. And if I want answers, I need to get answers, you know, either answer or shut up. And when the warrior is a part of you and you grow up with the warrior, you're used to listening because you know that the warrior never gives any any useful answers. You know, the warrior just asks questions. Then we have something much worse, uh, which is the critic or the, the Lord of self-loathing. This uh, image that you have on your right here, is, this is called the Red Dragon. Uh, it's, it was painted by William Blake. Uh, of, all the, of all the images that I, was, that I selected for the negative self-talk, this is the most dramatic one, or at least to me, the scariest one, because I think the critic is maybe the most powerful one. Because the critic is, is an explicitly malevolent, malevolent part of you whose goal is just to lower your self-esteem and shatter it as much as possible. In the long run, uh, the worrier might make you insecure, but the critic will make your self-worth you know, just completely go away. Or if it has been in your life for a long time, maybe the critic never allowed your self-worth to be formed to begin with, right? Uh, so the word the critic will find uh, any achievement that you may be proud of, and then it will destroy it. It will call it dumb, unoriginal, too easy, obvious. Uh, if you do something wrong, the warrior will attach these same labels to you. The warrior will tell you you're stupid. You have no idea what you're doing. Uh, if you, let's say you want to start therapy for, I don't know, hair pulling, uh, the warrior might say, what if, what if this therapy doesn't help me? Or uh, what if I need therapy forever? But the critic will say, even a therapist can't help you because you cannot be helped. That's how fucked up you are. Also, one thing that I like about the BFRB club is that, um, this is my platform, so I can swear if I want to swear. Uh, I don't have to be worried about what YouTube will say. Uh, so, but that's that's how the critic speaks. There is no gentleness or or compassion or love. The critic is there to destroy you, and his or her job is to negatively evaluate every single thing that you do. So that's the critic. Then we have the victim. Or Lord of Depression. Uh, so, uh, Lord of Depression is um, is more subtle. He works slowly. His voice is quiet. He doesn't make scenes. He doesn't use very strong words. I'm saying he, and I don't know why, because again, the gender of your sub personalities is, is really up to you to decide. I think it's maybe because I see this devil on the right on the painting, and I think. To me, this looks like a he, but I don't know. That just maybe says something about how I see men. Um, but this entity that stands on, on top of this woman who is in complete state of desperation, uh, that would be the, the Lord of Depression, right? He turns you into a victim. Uh, uh, the Lord of Depression sees hopelessness in every option that is available to you. So every option you can think of, every option that people can suggest. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation um, where, uh, so for example, I have a friend whose negative self-talk is usually this type. So he will call and then talk about how some things in his life are not good. Like, I don't know, his love life or his work or you name it. it. Just depends on the, you know, that's what friends are for. We just complain to each other about everything. But I'm a very practical person. And in therapy, it's practical to wait and let your clients 
you know, talk and wallow in their own feelings for as long as they need to process them, all that. But as a friend, I feel like it's practical to just suggest a solution. Uh, no one ever comes to therapy and tells me, uh, should I get another job? That's not up to me to decide, right? But if my friends tell me, I have an opinion, so I will share. And so I remember how it's been a while, uh, I think, like this was almost 10 years ago. So this friend was very unhappy with his job. Um, very, very unhappy, even though his career was quite good on looking, you know, from the outside, he was quite successful. But whatever project he would get for work, no matter how much money that would bring to the company or to him, he would always think of that as just being irrelevant or just pointless. Um, you know, uh, like just he didn't he didn't really see any it, there was no passion in him in any way. Uh, his inner his negative self talk would make everything seem meaningless. And then at one point, he started thinking about changing jobs. And I remember very well this conversation because I was on the beach. Um, uh, and so we were chatting in, in Telegram or one of these apps. And so um, he was telling me how everything is pointless and how there's nothing he can do. And he was just offered a job in Paris. But... Um, you know, does he really want to leave Berlin? So I said, why not? And he said, well, what's the point? And I was like, well, it's Paris. It's beautiful. So if your job sucks, this, the city is beautiful, much prettier than Berlin, in my opinion. There's art everywhere. There's, I mean, it's just, it's, it's Paris, France, for God's sakes. And then his response would be, well, I don't really see much purpose. There, you know, what if I'm not good at that job? What if, what if it's like this one? What if it's equally boring? What if it's equally pointless? And then I told him, well, I don't know what to tell you. Just come to Miami. Like, just do that. And then he said, yeah, but, you know, Miami is expensive. And I said, well, don't worry. We'll find you a place to stay for as long as you need. You'll get a job. And then he was like, what about if I don't get a job? So that's the Lord of Depression. No matter what you say and no matter how many things that you that you throw at someone, Lord of Depression will make every one of these options seem just pointless. Uh, that kind of self-talk likes to complain, constantly has regrets, always or frequently feels guilt about something. For example, when you interact with someone else's uh, negative self-talk of this type, like when I was talking to, to my friend, uh, he at, at one point made me angry. And I said, well, well, what do you want me to do? And then he responded with, well, that was always your problem. You just want to do something like it leads to anything. And then I thought, okay, this is just a pointless conversation. Let me just send him a cat meme and then we can get it over with. So that's the Lord of Depression. It gets you to give up, right? Uh, other people, when, when your Lord of Depression takes over, other people might be angry with you because if they start offering alternatives, uh, your helplessness and hopelessness, well, not yours, Lord of Depression's hopelessness, disarms them very easily. But the, the basic message that, that the victim or the Lord of Depression sends is that there is something inherently wrong about you. Like you have obstacles that, that simply are unsurmountable. There is nothing you can do to get out of it. And then we have the perfectionist. Uh, or the Lord of not good enough. Uh, the perfectionist's fundamental message is that you're not good enough, no matter what you do. Uh, the perfectionist actually has very little understanding of what is it that you want to do. But what the perfectionist does is that, that he or she confuses the map with the territory. Uh, the perfectionist sees an idealized version of something so he, here they, they see this image in your mind and everything that doesn't correspond perfectly with that image is simply not good enough. So the perfectionist will talk about what you must do, what you should do, because the perfectionist can only see the image that you imagine or that the perfectionist imagines. The perfectionist isn't capable of coming back to earth and then looking at the context of your actual lived experience. 
the it does the, the perfectionist doesn't know how to appreciate the efforts that you make the perfectionist doesn't appreciate the limitations that you have in a given moment it's certainly never pleasant to talk about the ways in which we are all limited but we are so the perfectionist is it has this fundamental blind spot uh, so whatever you do the perfectionist is going to say well you could have done it a little bit better you could have invested yourself a little more oh you could have seen that coming in fact you should have seen that coming uh, well you must do this in this situation uh, if you want to be productive no matter how much you work the perfectionist will say well you could work you know 15 minutes more or you could have worked instead of slept you know that's the way the perfectionist talks in the long run when one lives with the lord of not good enough that leads to burnout to chronic stress to exhaustion right there's a difference however don't confuse the perfectionist and the critic if i had to choose my favorites i definitely have my favorites there perfectionism is to be sure a difficult issue to deal with uh, uh, someone in one of the one of the webinars that I did uh, for uh, for skin pick or for trick stop, uh, someone said that they are a recovering perfectionist. So that tells you just the phrase tells you how difficult and demanding it is to get rid of the Lord of not good enough. But he pales compared to the critic, and the reason why he pales is is because uh, the the perfectionist doesn't want to destroy you. His intentions are obviously good. He wants you to do better. I'm, or, you know, the perfectionist wants you to be, or as perfectionists say, I just want to be perfect. And I always wonder if they're aware of the irony of just next to perfection, right? So that's what the perfect perfectionist wants. Whereas the critic, the critic wants you, you know, in tears. The critic doesn't want you to think anything good about yourself ever so there's this there's this obvious glaring difference that the, per, the perfectionists they're both destructive all four are destructive but the critic is the only one that is overtly destructive okay so let's link this to bfrbs so that you haven't been listening to me for all this time in vain uh I should say that there are two different ways in which I've only drawn one here, and I should have maybe added more to make things slightly more complicated. But let's start with what's on the on the this arrow. I don't know what else to call it. So this would be the standard way of how picking or pulling can start. Let's say that you you face a task at work. Uh, there's a lot to do. You're overwhelmed. And then when you realize that you might screw up or you might not finish things in time, negative self-talk comes about. You know, if you have the worrier, he's going to go or he's going to talk about, you know, what if you don't finish? What will your boss think? Uh, what if you don't do it well enough? Uh, the perfectionist might chime in and say, of course, you know, you should do it like this. It must be done this way. The critic will say you suck. So no matter how much you try, you're just going to fail because you're a failure. Um, you know, the, the, the victim might say, ah, it's never going to be good enough because it's me. I just can't do things well enough. But this kind of negative self-talk is going to lead to anxiety, to irritation, to hopelessness, to any kind of difficult emotion. And when difficult emotions build up, we know that the urge to pick or to pull is really just around the corner. And then once the urge becomes... It doesn't even have to become overwhelming. It just has to show up. And then one of the four, uh, one of the four people that I've just described is going to pick up on the fact that the urge is there. And then the victim will say, well, you know, the urge is there, so I might as well pull now. Uh, the critic will say, go ahead. You know, you suck so much that you would maybe even deserve to pull. Do you think you deserve better? That would be the critic. Uh, the perfectionist will look at this and say, no, you mustn't pull a single hair. And that's going to make your anxiety, of course, even worse. And then the urge will become overwhelming and then you might end up pulling. So each of these uh, will have, um, will have a, a role to play. 
uh, or the, the warrior might say, you know, what if the urge gets stronger? Oh my God, what then? What will happen? What if I cave in and pick? Uh, and then as you think this, it just feeds into the anxiety. So the negative self-talk actually has at least two places in which it, it acts. One is that it can initiate the whole sequence. And then the second one is that it amplifies the urge once the urge is there or whatever negative emotion might, you know, you, you experience. So it can both start and serve as an amplifier so that you get to the point where you pick or pull a little bit faster. And sometimes the, what I didn't put here and what I think is really important is to consider how BFRBs actually fit well into the stories that these parts of you actually have about the rest of you. If the, 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 the worrier's story is the what if things go wrong story, there's a story of someone who's very insecure, right? What's the role of the BFRB there? Perhaps pulling sometimes serves to quiet down the what ifs, or at least the, the emotional effects of the what ifs. Uh, sometimes uh, people will pick their skin and then the critic might show up and say you're a worthless human because you pick. But picking there doesn't necessarily serve to alleviate the effect of the critic's words. In fact, picking might be one of the ways in which the critic demonstrates to you that you're a worthless human being. So in, in some ways, BFRBs can come about as a consequence of self-talk, like an unfortunate way to cope with the emotional intensity that they create. But at other times, uh, BFRBs can be an integral part of the story that you tell yourself about yourself. Uh, for example, if uh, I, I don't know what ages everyone is who's listening to this, obviously, but one thing that I've noticed is that when people pull for years, uh, let's say 20, 30 years, uh, pulling, uh, the same applies to picking, it's just that I'm thinking of a specific client right now, so I'm using pulling as an example. Uh, the BFRB actually becomes the central pillar, pillar around which one's sense of identity starts to structure. So you might see yourself as fundamentally unworthy because you pick your skin or, or pull your hair. But when you do something for so long, uh, even if your self-worth is negative, if you feel bad, it will be difficult to change because it's a part of who you are. Uh, that, what I'm trying to say is that in a sense, symptoms, BFRBs included, even when they cause a lot of suffering for us, also give a kind of predictability. If you've been struggling with a BFRB for two, three, four decades, then that is more predictable than actually finding a healthy way to cope with your feelings. So a BFRB can be a safe place in a weird way. So we sometimes we become attached and this goes also for the four types of negative self-talk. The critic is, is a horrible person to live inside of us, but we get attached to the critic because he has such a central place in our lives. Uh, in his last seminar, uh, Jacques Lacan talked about the importance of the symptom. And he, he said something that that, webin that that seminar of his, I cannot even pretend to understand, but one of the things that, that that were said, or rather that I read in the transcript that, that I have, really struck me and sort of stayed with me. Um, it, he said something along the lines of, uh, sometimes it's cruel to take away a person's symptom because that's the only thing that's holding them, holding them together. Uh, and this does happen with BFRBs and the, the negative self-talk personalities. They cause a lot of suffering to us, but because so much effort in our life is directed around them to put them under control, to attenuate them somehow, to alleviate the suffering that they cause, at some point it actually becomes unimaginable to live without that. 
So BFRB might just reinforce that that identity of the critic of the warrior because they're necessary to us. I, I hope you, you realize that this then brings BFRBs into a field of therapy that is far beyond just pure replacement habits, right? Uh, it's then it becomes a matter of how we see ourselves a question of identity rather than just a habit to replace when you start let's say you start treatment you find yourself a therapist or um i don't know you do some some kind of self-help you find someone to to help you stop whatever you do but you find some kind of a treatment then, as it always goes, your enthusiasm for the treatment wears off at some point and you encounter your first obstacles. And then maybe the victim shows up. And then the victim says, there you go, you've relapsed again, you might as well give up now. And then if you still believe that part of you, if that part of you holds sway over you, you might actually give up. Uh, and then you give up. And then let's say you have the critic as well. And then the critic says, of course you gave up. You always give up because you're a failure. And then you feel guilt. And that lowers your self-esteem. It lowers your self-worth. You feel like you're wrong. And then when you feel like you're wrong, that just reinforces the victim. Because the victim, remember, it's the Lord of Depression. He makes you think that there's anything inherent, that there's something inherently wrong with you. So if you have more of these... They can also bounce off each other and kind of feed into each other. They're self-validating. But the, the, the negative self-talk that, that makes your BFRBs worse can actually significantly interfere in your treatment. Even if we're talking about something as simple as, as behavioral therapy, like habit reversal training, because you will always experience obstacles there will always be relapses. That's just how humans change. We're very messy and we just change that way. So negative self-talk can uh, make your, prolong your therapy unnecessarily. Uh, it can stop your therapy in its tracks if you allow it, allow your, your inner lord of whatever to, to stop it. Uh, this is uh, this is obviously Freud, uh, but this is a sketch by Dali. He met Freud once when Freud came to London from Vienna, I mean, escaping the imminent World War II. Uh, they met once very briefly. Uh, Dali was a great admirer of Freud's, uh, whereas Freud wasn't so much uh, an admirer of any contemporary painter. Freud's um, tastes in art were well, hopelessly old-fashioned. He didn't understand any of the surrealism that was very much in vogue at the time, uh, which is funny because he was almost godlike to them. Surrealism would never exist without Freud, and yet Freud wasn't capable of appreciating it. Um, anyway, so uh, negative self-talk usually comes from the messages that we got from important figures growing up. So parents, guardians, authority figures. Uh, and this doesn't mean that you had a mother who wanted to instill the critic in you so that you never feel confident. I don't think a parent thinks that way. I don't, honestly, I don't, I, I don't think really. I, I would be surprised if there are many parents out there who say, let me just say these things to my child and destroy their self-confidence forever, right? That's not exactly how it works. We internalize our understanding of their words. And when we're little, we're not quite capable or at least not very prof proficient in perspective taking. So we don't think in terms of what are our parents actually expressing by using these harsh words. We just take those harsh words to be truths and we work with it. So we internalize our interpretation and these internalized constructs take on a life of their own become one of the stories that we tell about ourselves, right? And then they live inside of us like these little voices that nag and criticize. So they come from relationships with important figures, but that doesn't mean that those figures are, are bad people in any way. 
sometimes it might mean they're difficult people, but it doesn't mean they're bad people. And it doesn't mean that their intention was to do that. Um, this, I'm saying this because I see this frequently in therapy that when we trace back some unhealthy patterns or ways of thinking back to one's parents, my clients then become very defensive. They say things like, uh, I don't want to talk badly about my parents. I had great parents, you know, and it's never about the parents. I don't even know what your parents are like. For all I know, you can tell me your father was a monster and I still don't know what your father's like. I know that you see him as a monster. That's it. But that's in therapy. Frankly, that's all I need to know. So in that sense, it's don't be shy to think in, the, in that way and to look at look at the evolution of your negative self-talk, honestly, uh, because it's not about them. It's about how you saw them. Uh, speaking of Freud, for example, um, he wrote this... Um, there's this booklet that I read a couple of years ago where they collected his essays on human sexuality or was it in studies of hysteria? Now, when I do, the trouble with me and references is that when I, when I talk, I don't just read the slides. I like to improvise or at least say what's on my mind in a given moment. And then I can't think of something precisely. And I also can't stop talking and go to the bookshelf and, you know, flip through my Freud books. But there, uh, it could be in studies of hysteria. It doesn't matter, actually. But initially, he he talked about the root of hysteria being some kind of sexual abuse or unacceptable sexual desire. Um, he wrote about this widely in his case reports, also about Dora and Anna O. Uh, they're very interesting to read, so I highly recommend them. Um, so, anyways, he uh, he talks at one point, uh, I guess. He heard so many sexual abuse stories as a psychoanalyst that at some point he was uh, he was a man of his time, the way that we are, you know, of ours. It's very simple. And then I guess it occurred to him at some point that it's hardly believable that every father in Vienna had at some point sexually abused their child. So he said that it doesn't really matter whether or not our earliest legally it matters of course but psychologically whether or not let's say a memory we have or an interpretation of an of an event whether or not they're exactly true and correspond to actually what to what actually happened it doesn't matter because it's the memory that hurts us so in that sense it doesn't matter whether or not your parents ever said you're worthless if what you got from your relationship with them is that you're worthless, then that's all that matters. Because we're talking about the processes that take place inside your head. Now, the trouble with these is that even when we initially maybe misinterpret the intentions that our parents had, um, our self-talk becomes a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, people who wonder what if is the worst outcome will with time have so many worst outcomes that they will expect nothing else. If the critic tells you you're a failure and you fail once, it's just going to amplify him telling you that you're a failure and then you're going to fail more because you will be preoccupied with feeling like a failure uh, to the extent that you will not actually think clearly. So you will be predisposed to fail even more. So negative self-talk has that power of, of just amplifying itself and making itself seem like reality. And that's why, uh, that's why transforming our self-talk depends on where it comes from, what are its messages, and what are its stories. So we have to really get to know our negative self-talk. Um, what I mean by this is not just write down all the horrible things that uh, you know, those parts of our, us tell us. Uh, that means to get to know them, but from a more, from a deeper, more meaningful point of view. Uh, think of every voice as a sub-personality. So when you think of them that way, you begin to externalize them. So you see them as something that is separate from you. This process is important for at least two reasons. One, it actually does allow you to get to know and understand that part better. So not to map out all the different reasons why the critic is evil, but to actually understand what is it like to 
see the world through the critic's eyes. When you, when the rest of you, I should say, see the critic, they see someone terrifying, malevolent, like a demon, uh, someone who hates you, wants you to have no sense of self-worth. But getting to know yourself talk means understanding what it's like to walk in those evil shoes. I guess in a way, that is what therapists do every way, every day. Like we get to know different worldviews, some of them painful, some of them scary, some of them fascinating. So uh, the procedure, the whole procedure of getting to know yourself talk so that you could change it can be described as a combination of introspection and diffusion. Because when you externalize, you can look at your sub-personality from different points of view and learn about it. So that would be the introspection part. But you start looking at that voice as something that is not you. So you de-identify with the voice or what we call in acceptance and commitment therapy, diffusion. So you're no longer glued to that voice because by getting to know your perfectionist, you are, you are impl- you're using a skill against the perfectionist that the perfectionist doesn't have and doesn't see, which is context. So when you understand the context of, of let's say the perfectionist psyche, you will understand those words in a different way. You will not understand them as being reflective of you, but of the biases that that part of you has. And then you will be able to assess how true they are or how important they are. And that's what we call diffusion. You defuse from something. Uh, A quick detour here. Uh, When you're fused with thoughts, you believe they're literally true. When you're defused, you can just see them as metaphors because that's what thoughts are. Uh, The same way that, that, you know, when you think of a feeling and then you think of a song, that song might be a symbol of how you feel. Uh, Your thoughts are also symbols or something else. It's just that we have a very specific relationship to language. And then we forget that language is really not a representation of reality in any way. So how do you get to know your negative self-talk? First, uh, write down the content of your self-talk. We have to start from the surface. What is it? Um, what is it that your uh, voice tells you? Just write them down. Write these things down in the most concrete way. It doesn't have to be profound. If the voice is you didn't make coffee well, then just write that down. Right. Make a list as long a list as possible. And the good time to make the list is when the voice is active. By making the list in that moment, you're actually separating yourself from the the voice so it can also help calm you down it will obviously give you the best possible information then once you have enough information just read through all that see what repeats and see if you can identify the type which one of the four that i described is your uh is your type of negative self-talk maybe it's a combination right uh if, that's, if it's a combination, you can come up with your own word for it. Over the years, I've had clients who would give names to their, uh, to their self-talk, like Brian. You know. um, in fact, th- I guess this is a good moment to, to display uh, a very esoteric form of knowledge, which is drag race. Um, so there is a, uh, there was a podcast that RuPaul used to do, or maybe he does it, I just don't listen to it anymore. Um, and he would interview some of the drag queens from his show. And one of them, Katya, who's completely fascinating, um, talked about uh, how she used to have this voice that she called Linda. And Linda would come sometimes before her performances and then tell her that she will suck, that no one will like her, that she's weird, that her sense of humor is not very relatable, like all these awful things. And then one day, Katya invented a new character called Carl, And then Carl, when Linda shows up, Katya would invoke Carl and then Carl would come and say, and I quote, oh, shut the fuck up, Linda. And then Linda would have to go away. So you can, this is, uh, this is a drag queen story that actually encapsulates like the core of a lot of contemporary psychotherapy. Um, So come up with a name. If the warrior is not good for you or the perfectionist or Lord of self-loathing, if none of these names seem appropriate to you, just come up with a name. It could be Stacy, Jennifer, you know, whatever, Robert, doesn't matter. 
Uh, then once you have a name, uh, if you have a hard time coming up with your name, maybe you want to do the third step first and then come back to the name. The third step is then to, dis to, de to determine the kind of voice that this is. So read some of the stuff that you wrote down, read it out loud, and then experiment with different voices and different intonations. Try saying it with a higher pitch, with a lower pitch. Uh, try saying it slowly uh, out loud. If you speak different languages, try you know, speaking in different languages. Um, describe the voice that suits this particular part of you the best, and then start visualizing its appearance. Like if it's a male voice, then is it a young male voice or an old male voice? Uh, what would be an appropriate posture for the person that's, that speaks in that specific way? If it's an old man, you know, it, does he stand tall? Is he in a good shape or in a bad shape? Uh, how would this person dress? I, I know that this sounds strange, but try to do that with as much detail as you can. Like give it, give your sub personality as many personality traits as you possibly can. So build on the voice, create a person out of it. But try then to understand that person. And this is, this is I will tell you some techniques how you can understand that person. But let me explain what the goal of the whole process is. Um, as the Rolling Stones song says, it's sympathy for the devil. That is the point. The point is for you to step into the shoes of that dark side of you and understand the logic so that you can put their messages in their proper context. Because only then can we start changing these messages. It's like, you know, you can't write literary criticism uh, of works of literature in, in languages that we don't know how to translate, right? This is why we don't have that much commentary on Etruscan literature, because we've never deciphered the language. So you have to decipher the language, understand the context, how, wh what is the world that this character inhabits? If you can cultivate the right attitude, uh, this is a quote from the Dalai Lama, if you can cultivate the right attitude, your enemies are your best spiritual teachers because their presence provides you with the opportunity to enhance and develop tolerance, patience, and understanding. And you have an inner enemy already, so you have a chance to practice every day. Uh, and then... We will expand on these right intentions by choosing the right methods to do that. Uh, so let me give you an example of how that might work. Uh, when you hear the warrior, right, uh, the warrior might make you very anxious. I'm talking now in generic terms. This, of course, might not be true for everyone, but this is just to illustrate the context. Uh, what I'm wondering about, once I do the process of visualizing, collecting data, imagining this is a person, so externalizing it, I can take a look at this person and wonder, what is it like to constantly be worried about something happening? Like, what is it like to always be on the precipice of some kind of disaster? To see a flower and think it's going to wither away. To see a beautiful house and think it's going to crumble. Uh, I don't know, like visit the St. Peter's Cathedral, see Michelangelo's La Pieta, and then think, what if someone vandalizes it and then it's destroyed forever? It's a very joyless world. It's a world where uh, there's no safety, there's no security. So that part of you that tells you all these things that make you anxious actually says that because maybe they come from a place where nothing is safe a part that feels extremely unsafe. And someone that feels extremely unsafe perhaps needs to learn how to feel safer. So a new narrative should perhaps include this topic of safety. We can think, let's say the perfectionist. The perfectionist is very annoying with his musts, shoulds, have tos. But maybe you can imagine uh, if you if you if you succeed in connecting the perfectionist to one of your parents, maybe then you can think, okay, so this annoying voice that makes me feel horrible so frequently could actually have parental intentions. So something that my uh, something that my parents would have said, and my parents would have said these things to me because they want me to do better, not because they want me to fail. You know, so maybe 
the you're not good enough narrative should be replaced with uh, here's how you can improve next time. Something that will be constructive, that will give you a direction to moving to, in, you know, going forward instead of dwelling on what you don't do well. Right. So it's important to, by understanding that part of yourself, no matter how dark that part is, uh, either to recognize a good intention or a fundamental suffering that that part experiences. So for example, when it comes to the critic, it's very hard to find something good about the critic because it, it has such evil goals, like it wants to destroy your self-confidence. But then you can think how much bitterness and what a lack of joy uh, that person experiences. Imagine living and seeing in every beautiful thing in this world, something to destroy or corrupt or contaminate. There is no pleasure there. Maybe there's gloating. Maybe there's feeling like you've accomplished your mission, but there is no enjoyment. There is no serenity. There is no equanimity. So it's a dark place to be in. Someone like that, as horrible as they are, at least according to the Dalai Lama, and I agree with him, deserves compassion. So if you incorporate this idea into a new narrative, you're in effect disarming the critic because you're taking the source of his destructiveness and then finding a way to grow from there, right? So a new narrative has to focus on the good intentions that you cultivate towards that person in the process of, of getting to know them, right? And then be clear about the elements of the new story. If you like to write, just sit down and write a story. That's very simple. Just write one story as, as that part of you is now, and then write another story where you will spin those key elements. My suggestion is to find one, two, or maybe three key things around which a new narrative will, um, will, will, will be spun. So for example, if we take the warrior, we can say that the warrior feels very insecure, that it wants to help you feel feel prepared. And then you can take these two things, uh, which is uh, feeling safe and preparedness. But preparedness can be also uh, can be also told as um, what is it that I can do already to keep myself safe. You know, it doesn't have to be, oh my God, something horrible will happen. It can also be, uh, I have the tools. And then if something horrible happens, it'll be unpleasant, but I have the tools. So you can spin the, the, the fundamental problem with, the, with, the, with that personality so that it works to your advantage, right? The key points of your new narrative should include your values or let's say the values of other parts of your personality. And especially those values that actually overlap with that specific sub personality. So if you, if we, if you take the perfectionist or even the victim, uh, you could very well share values with them. The victim also wants to live a meaningful life, except that it believes that there's something intrinsically wrong with you, so you can't. But of course, then you have to spin that value in a in a different way. The perfectionist also wants you to be successful at your career and it'll take you straight to burnout with, with their, you know, with the imperatives of productivity and ne things being always unfinished and, and never good enough. But then you can, you can, you can reframe this to be, I have to rest precisely so that I could be prepared when I go to work. So that my brain works, so that my body serves me, right? Uh, you can learn, you can introduce the notion of context into, into the perfectionist's life because that is what the perfectionist is missing. So what do we do with this? Uh, you can start off uh, in some of the following ways. You can write a letter to your critic or your perfectionist or your victim, you know, whatever, however you imagine that part of you. Uh, and in that letter, you can, you can explain your point of view. 
and that letter should be should not be typed up in five minutes in your lunch break. Just give it some time, really feel the letter, work on it for a long periods of time. You can use the hot seat technique, which is something that we use in therapy or more specifically in offline therapy and in workshops where we take two chairs, you sit on one and then we imagine, I don't know, like the, the critic on the other chair and then you two have a conversation, you engage in dialogue and then you get to explain how you feel, the critic gets to respond and then you try to take each other's perspectives. Uh, you can actually do this on your own and trust me, doing that with chairs and walking around from one chair to another as, you, as, as you're having the conversation, this can really be very helpful. I know it sounds silly and it looks silly, but this is actually one of the more powerful therapeutic techniques that I know of. It's, it's fascinatingly powerful, even when it's done on your own. You can journal, but with perspective taking. So you can create a journal uh, from the point of view of the critic. You can practice compassionate rephrasing. This is important because uh, there's no point in arguing with these voices. You will just make your BFRB worse should you do that. Our minds have a particular trollish quality. And then the more you argue with them, the worse they get. It really is like online trolls. Who has ever won uh, an argument with someone online? Never. Because they'll come back with ridiculous arguments, uh, with, you know, they will straw man you to death. So it's not possible to win, but you can compassionately rephrase. So a warrior, your warrior comes about and says, oh my God, what if this competing response that I'm trying to implement now fails? And then one way to rephrase this is um, you can, you can either, you can either say, um, something along the lines of um, I have the um, I'm trying to I use an example and I'm trying to figure out how to rephrase it um, so if if let's say the main worry is uh, my competing response is going to fail you can say uh, you can rephrase this as, as the worrier is afraid that my competing response might fail and this is making me feel anxious. So I will come up with a backup. Or you can simply remind the warrior that there are many competing responses out there. There are so many tools that you can use, right? So you can also do that. You shouldn't say your worry is invalid. That's not the way to go. The way to go is to say, I understand, but here's how we can minimize the damage should this happen or uh, look, we have a wealth of resources that we can choose from. You can also use nonverbal gestures, things that would calm you down. For example, putting one hand on your chest and another hand on your belly or just one hand on your chest. These are kind of silent ways of, of showing compassion to ourselves. And sometimes when these parts of you are not well verbalized, this works better than words. Uh, so this concludes our first uh, BFRB Club webinar. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, I, I'm, I hope you've actually made it this far. Uh, we will be having these monthly and check out the post below. I, I will post a few questions about the format of these webinars because I would like you impu your input. After all, I am making them for you. Uh, thank you very much, and um, until next month.